and it can be downloaded from our website. The tool draws on both international and regional standards and on a wide array of constitutional practices throughout the world. And I should acknowledge the, the beautiful artwork that we have been able to use for this publication. It is from a painting called Ancestors by Sarita King, Aboriginal woman artist from, from Australia. And the original painting is hanging on the wall of our office at the uh, Australian National University. IPCAT was written in English and will be soon available in Spanish, uh, French and Tagalog of the Philippines. And translations to many more languages is certainly an area we wish to invest in. And also invite uh, other organizations and, and governments too to do so. All our publications, uh, including IPCAT, uh, are published under the Common Creative License and are freely available uh, for users and also free to be translated. But let us know if you plan to translate the tool because we would uh, we would love to know. We hope that it that will uh, reach far and wide and prove useful for groups and communities in in assessing their constitutional and legal frameworks from indigenous people's perspectives and uh, in designing advocacy around those findings as well. And we will certainly appreciate any thoughts from our commentators, from any other users and readers about on how to further improve our tool. Thank you all very much. And uh, I'll hand, uh, hand over the screen to Amanda Katsperil. Uh, thank you very much, Lena, for the lovely overview and introduction to today's event and also for joining us at such a late hour in Australia. Um, I want to welcome everyone from a very different time zone in California, uh, where we're just beginning the day. Um, and thank you for joining us for this event, Assessing Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Constitutions. Um, as Lena shared, we are focusing on our new, uh, relatively new Indigenous Peoples' uh, Rights and Constitutions Assessment tool, which is um, from our side much more than a publication, but really a methodology and approach um, to looking at Indigenous people's rights and constitutions, and also to taking a rights-based approach to constitution building itself with the assumption that constitutions are a very important site for protecting and promoting the rights of a variety of groups, but certainly not least um, Indigenous peoples. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, as Lena said, we are joining your event and we very much appreciate um, that you've included us and given us this opportunity to share um, the methodology with you. Uh, with that, I am gonna share my screen now. So I hope um, it works. And also if, can you see the screen, Lena? Okay, excellent. Um, so I will try to also stick to the time. I know we have uh, other speakers who will really hopefully help me. Um, I, I would like to go over today um, the tools development methodology and you know potential ways that it might be applied around um, the Asia Pacific region where I particularly focus a lot of my work, but also um, beyond that, of course, um, globally. Uh, this is a tool that in, in theory belongs to IDEA's global program um, and should should be able to be applied equally across all different countries. Um, when we look at the examples that are included in the tool, you'll see that they do come from all regions of the world. Um, so I'll just touch briefly on why we developed the Indigenous Peoples Constitution Assessment Tool. Um, I think we're looking at global trends around democracy. So there's increased focus on, on democratic participation, accommodating diversity, um, indigenous people's recognition in constitutions. I think this is um, obviously a huge issue in Australia, as Lena mentioned, but around the world, there's sort of a growing movement for recognition and how that might translate into different forms of rights. Um, also, at IDEA, just looking in constitution building, we realize a lot of issues are coming up around autonomy arrangements and self-determination, um, decentralization and pushes for federalism from a rights-based standpoint. So we thought it would be good to also, again, um, enable indigenous peoples to look at these issues and see um, if in fact, the way that their rights are protected in, in a constitution um, uh, is leading to robust enforcement and implementation of those rights. Um, of course, natural resource management and development is also a huge issue in light of climate change and an issue very close um, to indigenous people's rights. 
And finally, there's been an increased focus globally on how to change fundamental laws and structures, including constitutions and, and other institutions, um, for the purpose of conflict mitigation and management, and essentially to build peace um, and promote nation building. The IPCA itself um, recognizes the import of constitutions, as I said, as a document for protecting and promoting indigenous rights. Um, they really came out of, uh, personally, also my work, but with Lena, of course, on um, international indigenous people's rights and international standards and realizing sometimes that um, the capacity of the international system to truly intervene on behalf of indigenous peoples can, of course, be limited. But if rights are also um, protected in a domestic constitution, um, that, that gives you really a platform to um, approach courts and other institutions at the national level for better implementation of indigenous people's rights. So while recognizing the incredibly important role that international standards play, um, we also thought it's important to think about how these standards can be translated into constitutional provisions. Um, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights in Constitutions Assessment Tool methodology and structure is based on International Ideas Constitutional Assessment for Women's Equality. Um, importantly, the Women's Equality Assessment very much takes a substantive um, equality approach to constitution building, but equality itself is the main theme. And when we look to adapt that methodology for Indigenous Peoples' Rights, what we realized is that Indigenous Peoples' Rights go way beyond equality, of course, that's part of it. Um, but there are many other issues that are touched upon that are animated by other principles, for example, self-determination. Um, so even though the methodology is similar, um, the actual content of the tool is quite different. And the IPCAT, again, takes a very rights-based approach um, that is a slightly uh, distinct from the Constitution Assessment for Women's Equality. Um, I'm honored to say that I've been working on this tool for God, it's kind of scary, but almost six years now. Um, we published it last year for Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, but of course, with COVID, it was difficult to organize any real events around it. Um, so this is our first attempt to truly promote the tool within the UN system and amongst Indigenous communities that we might not have current contact with. Um, before the tool was put out, we felt it was very important to ensure that Indigenous peoples themselves had reviewed it, um, as well as other um, experts that are working on these issues globally. So we had a number of expert reviews of the tool, which was individual reviews, as well as organizational piloting in Nepal and in um, Mindanao in the Philippines, hence our two speakers today, who um, get to shortly. Uh, so why assess the Constitution? Um, at IDEA, we talk about the Constitution being existing really at the intersection of legal, political, and social um, aspects of society. So it's important that constitutions um, can reflect the values of a country, but also its aspirations and where it might be going. How, how can you bring these ideas of um, social and cultural rights together with ideas of broader justice um, and restructuring political power? Um, we do see constitutions as a transformative tool for changing the relationships between groups and also um, between governments, but there is a risk that um, constitutions can freeze certain rights or identities and entrench the status quo, which can, of course, dangerous, so I don't want to say it's all good, but I think that overall, um, we do see that constitutions, even if they protect Indigenous rights in a sort of less than perfect form, can provide a very important base then for advocacy for reform and improvement. Um, the IPCA, importantly, does not intend to judge a constitution. We're not trying to give a constitution a, a grade and say this one is great at protecting Indigenous rights and this one is not. Um, but rather, it's really about assessing, um, hence the name, and to help people set an informed and evidence-based advocacy agenda. Um, the idea is that constitutions can often be very overwhelming to approach um, for everybody. Um, and we wanted to really increase ownership and understanding of constitutional text amongst communities. So the idea is to make a user-friendly <clears throat> methodology that allows people to approach the constitution um, in sort of small pieces while still taking a holistic understanding of how constitutions can promote indigenous rights. Um, importantly, I should say the tool can of course be used in times of constitutional reform or change, but it is also relevant at any point of time um, in a country's constitutional history, um, especially for Indigenous groups that are looking to push the social contract, as Lena said, and sort of redefine their place in society. 
Um, when looking at the tool, it's important to note that not all constitutions contain all types of provisions or in the same way. So not having a provision is not necessarily a bad thing. Again, this is not about creating a constitution. So just because um, a certain issue is not reflected in the constitution, that might just provide more opportunities for reform. Or again, sometimes things are included in constitution in a sort of negative way or more limiting way, and that can actually be a barrier to Indigenous rights. So um, we have to look beyond whether or not the provision is just there and really look at the details of how it's drafted. Um, if it's not there, is there a reason? Um, and what are some of the ways that international standards and practices in other countries might help us to think of solutions um, in terms of institutional design and, and also design of the constitution? Um, I'll just really quickly go through the IFCAT methodology. I appreciate that Lena showed you the front page. I do really encourage you to take a look at the tool. Um, it's free for download and um, we are also happy to look into printing it and developing it in different languages as Lena mentioned. So please feel free to follow up after if you are interested, but I'll just try to give a brief overview of what the tool actually um, looks like. So the IPCAT again is helpful to identify strengths, weaknesses and gaps um, in, between international standards, best practices and the constitutional text of um, someone's country. Um, and it's really about setting an evidence-based and informed advocacy agenda. Um, and I don't want this to be taken purely as a civil society initiative. Um, I think it's really important and that's why we're very lucky that one of our speakers is representing the government perspective and one the civil society perspective today because the tool is really targeting both those groups. And while um, I don't think about advocacy necessarily as only a civil society activity, um, government officials can also be champions um, to advocate certain agendas within their normal realm of work. Um, certainly Romy, I think will reflect on this um, in his work in the BTA. Uh, so it is important that also um, government actors are empowered to really understand what the constitution says about indigenous rights. And especially if they're going to in some way represent indigenous people's interests um, to have an informed advocacy agenda that can be grounded in realistic and feasible provisions and practices. Um, so the IPCAT can be applied in a number of ways. Um, and I think the hopefully our um, speakers will also reflect on this. Uh, it's possible to do as an individual or a group assessment. Um, as an individual assessment, the tool can be used by any uh, expert or interested party that wants to look at the constitution. There's no requirement for any legal expertise per se. Um, we have been trying to really work with the tool um, in the form of group assessments. Um, you know, again, drawing on the benefits of participation, but recognizing that um, that there's a lot that can come out of dialogue and discussion around the tool and its questions um, that maybe gets lost when it's just an individual in a room. Um, the materials that you might need when you're looking at the Indigenous Peoples uh, Constitution Assessment Tool is, of course, the constitution of your country, but it's important to have access to other laws and gazettes for, for research as well. So again, oftentimes constitutions might say, as shall be, um, described in law and it's important to check whether those laws actually came into fruition but also whether they're in line with the constitution so um, the tool while it focuses on constitutions is not meant to stop there um, you don't need to go through the whole tool uh, every section every question um, if you're interested particularly in land rights for example or in representation in parliament or legislative bodies through quotas and other mechanisms, then you can skip to that question um, and really just look at that. Uh, the tool is meant to be broken down into different parts in that way. Um, importantly, the methodology does not provide the answers, but it's really providing a structured approach to textual analysis. Um, and that needs to root the results of the tool in the specific context. So um, the answers will really come out of, out of the participatory exercise or the assessment itself. Um, really basic overview, um, the tool again is uh, represents a rights-based approach to constitution building. It's divided into eight um, thematic sections and under each of those sections are um, divided 33 total questions that are divided amongst these sections. And um, we'll look at that in a moment. Each question includes a brief explanation of the issue it's looking at, um, and then a table which includes international standards and good practice example provisions from constitutions around the world. Um, it's important to note that in doing this research, um, you know, indigenous people's rights and constitutions is really an emerging field. Um, Latin America has quite a lot more practice with this than other parts of the world, just being a bit 
um, ahead on these concepts and probably because it was so pressing from such an early point of state building in Latin America, but um, Asia, Africa now really exploring um, how to protect indigenous peoples, not only in constitutions, but in legislation. And since there are limited examples currently of constitutional provisions, um, we did draw upon court decisions and legislation um, in developing the tool in order to ensure we were capturing the uh, nuances of how indigenous rights are being um, practiced and promoted. Um, the good practice also includes sample language for evidence-based advocacy. So again, we'll go over that in a moment, but essentially the idea is that the examples can you can actually borrow wording from the examples when you're advocating for improvement of provisions in your own country. Um, so you could say, I really like how they did this in Chile, for example, um, and you're pulling direct wording. It's all there for you in the tool and you don't have to do uh, the research yourself. And finally, each question um, ends with a format or a template for users to record their findings and views on, on how to improve and strengthen. That's the action planning. So we'll get to that also in a moment. Um, the IPCAC covers a broad scope of issues as called for by Indigenous peoples' rights, but um, it's important to note that most constitutions do not address every issue in the assessment, even constitutions that are considered extremely progressive from an Indigenous people's standpoint do not include um, all of these issues. So there's always scope, again, for greater um, inclusion of these issues are also for using other rights, like a basic right to equality that might be included in the constitution um, to push and expand on specific mention of indigenous peoples and their rights. Um, as I mentioned before, some issues may be addressed through legislation or um, law outside of the constitution. There's some issues that may not be relevant um, to different country contexts. So again, this is why the tool is meant to be sort of adaptable. Um, there also might be issues coming up in countries that are not reflected in the assessment tool. Um, so for example, in the Philippines, we had quite a lot of discussions around um, military's right to enter indigenous people's land. Um, and this became, when I started to look at it, it's not an issue that's addressed very directly in a lot of constitutions. So uh, we didn't end up including a separate question on it, but it doesn't mean that it's not a very important issue that affects a lot of communities around the world. Uh, the eight sections of the IPCAT are recognition and citizenship, uh, right to equality and anti-discrimination, foundations for indigenous people's rights, um, autonomy, agreement making, and self-government, uh, consultation, political participation, and representation, um, land, territories, and natural resource rights, a right to culture and social and economic development, and finally, protecting and promoting Indigenous people's rights, which kind of recognizes that um, you can have very uh, robust rights in the other seven categories, but if there aren't mechanisms um, for implementing those rights, be they courts or special commissions, um, it will be very difficult to ensure that they are meaningful in practice. Um, this is just an example to show you how certain questions fit under a section. So this is section one on recognition and citizenship. And then you see that you have a few questions um, that fall under that general heading. So um, that's kind of what the tool looks like in, in all sections. The sections have slightly different numbers of questions. Um, depending on the scope of issue that they're looking at. Um, as I mentioned, each question is also accompanied by an explanation. Um, so here you have this, this question number 22. Um, does the question recognize, constitution recognize indigenous languages and associated language rights? And then this is only a, a small subset of the explanation, but this kind of walks you through an introduction to what indigenous language rights really mean um, and look like and why they're important. Um, then the tool includes the international standards as relevant, mostly from UN DRIP and ILO 169, though it also pulls from ICCPR and other um, conventions where relevant. Um, and again, this is basically, it's a, it's a direct quote. Um, as a lawyer, um, of course, I love words. I think words are very important, but the tool is also structured around recognition of that and the fact that these specific words that are used um, both in the international standards and in constitutions are very important. So um, that's why we've included the actual text from the constitutions and, um, and the treaties and not just reference the article numbers so people can really um, read them and see what kind of words they might wanna see reflected in their own constitution. Um, after the international examples there and standards, there's national examples. Um, so these are, again, under the area of language rights, just for an example, but you see one from Finland, one from Colombia. Um, and again, it has an article number from the constitution, the actual text, which has been 
translated into English if needed and um, a sort of summary of what the provision is really saying and, and doing. Um, following that, you have the findings and action section. As I mentioned, all of the questions are meant to be yes, no questions, um, and but you're not supposed to stop at a yes, no answer. So the idea is also to um, note down specific things again about the wording or if there's any contradictory provisions in the constitution that you wanna go back and look at. Um, and the finding section is followed by an action section. Um, I'll get into this in a moment in more detail, but I think it's really important to note that actions can be very simple things that so you might be doing the finding section. Um, if we take the example of language rights and you might see in the constitution that it says that language rights should be developed through law. Um, and you might not know off the top of your head whether they have been developed by law or if there is a law on that topic in your country. So the action could be as simple as going out to research that and then to read the law um, and see how it aligns with national standards. So uh, international standards, so you can, um, shape the actions. They can be as big as running a radio um, campaign and as small, again, as doing some personal research. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's just basically about words again, which I've already um, shared. So the findings section, um, again, the questions are meant to be yes and no, but often there'll be more than one provision that's relevant to answering the question. So it's important not to just stop at one article or one section of the constitution, but to really read through the constitution and see, are there other provisions um, that might be relevant? So if you're looking at representation in parliament, for example, you might wanna look at the elect section on elections, but also um, the role of parliament in society, right, might be important. So it's important to look beyond, again, the very specific provisions. Um, the findings and responses should consider whether, of course, whether the Constitution includes provisions relevant to the issue. Um, and if no, then you want to go to the action section and maybe start developing a plan for advocating for inclusion of those issues. Um, if yes, you want to list the specific provisions um, and then look at whether they could be improved or enhanced. And again, looking if the phrasing is consistent with international standards. Um, we find the actions to be the most critical section. So these actions should be based on findings, but it's really the way that the tool takes shape and supports um, real advocacy on the ground or the promotion of an indigenous people's rights agenda within a government institution, for example. Um, some examples of findings, again, if the provision doesn't exist, you might wanna advocate for reform to the constitution, which is difficult. So it's also possible to focus more on a policy or a legislative level. Um, if the provision does exist, but the wording is problematic, maybe um, you could have an action plan for how it could be improved, citing other examples from the, around the world, or maybe you would want to have a court case. Um, Shankar, I think, can reflect on um, the power of this, of um, going before the Supreme Court and asking for an interpretation of certain provisions, which has some risks, but can be um, very beneficial. Um, and of course the provision might exist and be well worded, but you still know that there's problems in actual implementation. So again, the action might be related to really pushing for better implementation of a good provision that's just sitting on paper. Um, we talk about smart planning. I'm gonna probably skip this too in the interest of time, but um, questions to guide action planning can include looking again, whether specific language changes are needed. Um, is there a possibility of addressing through something short of constitutional change and what further research and advocacy might be required. It's important when you're thinking about actions just not to be too general or too broad because then it's very hard to have follow-up. So the idea um, with the smart action planning is really to have a specific um, time-bound plan for how you want to address these issues. Um, I'll conclude now basically, but just to say that, um, you know, after the IPCAT, is over and you've done the assessment, what really matters, of course, is how the findings are used, um, how the actions are implemented. Um, it's important to sort of prioritize. A lot of times there's gonna be many issues, many sort of quote unquote shortcomings that you might identify that you wanna work on, um, but it's important to identify matters that might require immediate attention um, and also prioritize constitutional provisions that might require implementation because that's a good place to start and build trust with the government before pushing for reform. Um, it's also the IPCAT can be a tool for educating people, government, civil society, and media on how the constitution promotes and protects indigenous people's rights. So um, with the Kawe in uh, the women's equality assessment that we worked on in Myanmar, we're now 
um, breaking down small briefs that look at certain issues and draw really draw on the assessment on the women's equality assessment, but also um, on the context in Myanmar to reflect on how women are um, situated in society there. But we we basically have used those briefs as a way to summarize the findings and bring them forward um, to different actors within the Myanmar context. Um, target audience will obviously depend on who you are, right? If you are a government actor, um, your target audience might be other government actors that you're trying to um, help understand or support indigenous people's rights and issues. Um, so key political decision makers, if you are also civil society is important. So um, targeting political party leaders or elected members, if they're specialized commissions, um, maybe looking at what those are and the procedures in your country to approach them. Um, it's also good to think about how uh, civil society and the media can help to kind of share these messages and bring them to the attention of the general public. Um, of course, international actors in the UN system, which is why we're here today. Um, and then the general public, citizens and non-citizens, it might be very important to also explain to them Indigenous people's rights, especially um, as you see, for example, in Chile now, um, these moments when this kind of pierces through into the public consciousness and everyone's sort of talking and thinking about constitutional reform and Indigenous people's rights. Um, it's good to have a strategy for how you're going to address the public on these issues to, to ensure support. Um, let's skip this post assessment communications and just um, thank you all again for your time uh, and for listening to me. I'm sorry if that was very fast, but the tool is again online and available um, at any time if you'd like to look at it. And I myself am available by email or phone um, to discuss the tool and the way it might be might be applied um, in your country or your work. Um, so with that, I think I will conclude my section of the presentation, though I will be here through Q&A um, to answer questions as well um, on the tool and some of our experiences in implementing it. Um, for now, I would like to turn over to our speakers, um, Romy Saliga from the Philippines and Advocate Shankar Limbu um, from Nepal. Um, I, both countries are very uh, close to my heart and we've been working um, with both on the development of this tool for many years now, um, but I do want to acknowledge that Shankar um, was my first boss um, ever out of law school and I was lucky enough to do a fellowship um, with him and his organization, the Lawyers Association for the Human Rights of Nepalese Indigenous Peoples. Um, in 2011 to 2012, um, when there was an active constitution writing process going on in Nepal. Um, Shankar has provided excellent leadership to the indigenous peoples movement in Nepal for many years, um, not only by bringing critical cases in front of the Supreme Court, um, but also serving in the international community on MRIP um, formally uh, and really actually um, doing community trainings and educating people on complicated legal concepts to ensure that communities can engage on these concepts from around Nepal. Um, so it's a true honor to have him here with us today. Um, and it was great to work with him on this tool um, since he's essentially my origin story to being part of this uh, movement at all. And uh, Romy Saliga is, um, as Lena mentioned, a member of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. So um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Philippines re in 2019 passed uh, the Bangsamoro Organic Law, which essentially was meant to um, put action behind the constitutional commitment to greater autonomy uh, for the Bangsamoro region, which is in the southern part of the Philippines. Um, and the idea actually was, of course, to increase, as usual with um, decentralization, to increase autonomy and uh, participation decision making. But there's a number of provisions on indigenous people's rights, um, some which are very progressive, actually most of which are very progressive, um, but figuring out how these interact with the national framework for indigenous people's rights and also for Romy, I think representing um, indigenous peoples within the BTA, um, what their issues are and really pushing for attention. Um, I saw recently that he is sponsoring different bills. Um, so really pushing for, you know, um, a furthering of the indigenous people's agenda within within Mindanao. So uh, with that, I will turn it over um, just to say again that they, they reflect two different perspectives. So Shankar, of course, is coming more from the civil society perspective. Um, 
as a, as a lawyer and advocate, and Romy, um, though he has a background in that area as well, um, is really now speaking more from the government side. So I really appreciate in the remarks that both of them can kind of bring out what those distinctions might be and how the tool might be useful or limited, um, as Linda said, um, for each of your respective sectors. So I think uh, we'll start with Shankar, if that's all right. And um, I will just mute myself. Shankar, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, providing this opportunity to international uh, idea. Uh, this is a very relevant program to expose about the relevant tools relating to the constitutions and how the constitutions can be assessed. Um, and I, once again, that uh, it's good to see you and, and you said, you just address me as a boss. Now you are my expert. That's the mm -hmm. turnover now. <laughs> okay, uh, the constitution is not only the supreme law. It is the source of rights, powers, and resources of the nations. However, this is not always the case. In the context of indigenous peoples, in many cases, constitution is the source of discrimination exclusion and institutionalizes the structural violence against indigenous peoples. It is also the political documents that reflects the collective will of the people. However, the challenge is indigenous peoples are not recognized as the peoples in many constitutions in the world. Even many constitutions in the world recognize the indigenous peoples, their rights, which are good to read, but not realized on the ground. That results <clears throat> multiple forms of injustices, including racism, assimilation, discrimination, exclusion, and dispossessions from land, territories, and natural res resources, and many more. So that's why the Constitution has like dark side and a bright side as well. So now I come to the uh, the sharing about the Constitution. 2015 of Nepal and the constitution making process that Amanda briefly touched upon. Uh, we were very lucky to having Amanda at that time. That was a very crucial time for us because we needed so many information and ex experts and also the connecting with the different organizations in the constitution making process to know about the norms and values of the constitutions and also the constitu I mean, the conventionally, we all know about that constitutions and constitution making processes. It's, it's captured by the elite in many countries. So, but that's not the case right now that what we have experienced. It's a participatory process. And it's also the, the, it's, it's a, the domain is now not only to the light, uh, for the light, but it's a domain of the people and the ground. So that is very crucial. So the discrimination, dispossession, historical injustices that might be the source is the constitution, which I mentioned about it. That was also the case in Nepal, where I'm from. So we had like 10 years of armed conflict led by the Maoist party and 7,000 people lost their lives, and lots of human rights violations. And it's still the, the impact we have been facing now from the both sides. Uh, the, these, the human rights violations were occurred by the army and the, and, and the, the Maoist uh, fighters side as well. The majority victims were indigenous peoples for two reasons. The Maoists raised the indigenous peoples issues uh, such as like historical injustices and structural violence and racism based on a Hindu caste system that uh, and then so that uh, the, the, the strategy of the Maoist entice the indigenous peoples and the large number of indigenous peoples, they joined in a Maoist force. And the, the second one, uh, the Maoists fought in the indigenous areas. So there was a peace uh, <clears throat> accord in 2006 concluded with having a kind of national consensus uh, promulgating new constitutions uh, through the constituent assembly. So meaning to say that the constitu constitution is also the tool for the conflict management as well in the context of Nepal. And also the, uh, when we talk about the conflict, uh, then it's, that impacts to the indigenous peoples, obviously, 
um, because they are so vulnerable. And then also the constitution making process directly, um, <clears throat> it's a concern of indigenous peoples and everywhere. So, um, <clears throat> But the, what happened is the first constituent assembly, uh, there was overwhelming representation of indigenous peoples. But when we talk about the representation of uh, indigenous peoples, um, the, the representation was not meaningful, meaning to say that they were not accountable to the indigenous peoples, but they were accountable to their respective political parties. So we had like very slim um, space to raise the indigenous peoples issues. I know, I know that uh, I still remember Amanda and I, we were just like, uh, struggling to know about that, uh, the what kinds of good practices uh, the, the, the around the world and what could be the best uh, to you know the approach uh, in the constitution make, making process, the how the indigenous peoples can um, intervene in effectively. So uh, I guess that was the very beginning to emerge this tool. So the indigenous, I mean the Amanda conceived probably that that's the uh, tool. Uh, see. I did not uh, <clears throat> mention about the, about it, but I guess uh, when I when the tool came up uh, as a book uh, form, then I, I realized I recalled about that whole process. Um, again, come back to the constitution making process. The first constituent assembly was dissolved because the indigenous peoples were so organized and so effective, and their lots of issues were raised in the constitution making process. The dominant group, the Hindu high caste group who dominated the country uh, for the 250 years. They did not want it to uh, give a power share to the indigenous peoples and other excluded groups like Dalit and other Madhisis. So meaning to say that the constitution making process, uh, it's also a process bringing uh, all excluded groups uh, in, in, in our countries, in our ex experience. I guess that when I read about the tools, it has been reflected very well uh, that how these excluded groups can be included in the constitution making process, which is very, very crucial. And uh, the first CA was dissolved. And then uh, this, there was a second CA. So the second CA was structurally formed systematically exclude the indigenous peoples and other marginalized groups. And so that the constitution making process ironically taken away again by the elite groups. So I have to raise about it. And then I, when I gone through these tools, that is marvelously uh, explained about that, how this process can be uh, you know, taken away and how the excluded group can still uh, be very active and then can be careful about uh, this whole process so they can be the part of the constitution making process. So, so the, the, the new constitution was promulgated in 2015. And then what happened is uh, there was a kind of um, <clears throat> a big argument between the excluded groups, including indigenous peoples and the dominant group because the, the dominant group, uh, I mean, the mainstreaming political parties were um, <clears throat> representing the dominant groups. So they were saying that the new constitution is the best constitution of the world. And then so indigenous peoples were and the indigenous peoples movements and indigenous peoples uh, leaders are quite um, <clears throat> reluctant so what's happening uh, and how to assess about the, the, the constitution so we use these tools uh, timely manner that uh, the draft form it was provided by amanda and that you used to analyze about the constitutions and what happened uh, that that we came to know that this the new constitutions there are 11 provisions out of like 300 articles there are 11 provisions against the indigenous peoples 23 provisions which discriminates and then 49 provisions that exclude the indigenous peoples and five provisions that establishes the supremacy of a caste area again so that we came to know that this constitution is the racist constitution so that on that ground, indigenous peoples started taking the movement and the government says that the constitution is not written in the, in the stone or so it can be changed over a time. So they have to you know, step back from their position. So that's why these kinds of tools is very helpful. I, I, I guess uh, this is very important. This tool, when I uh, read, uh, gone through it, 
it has like two parts. One is like procedural part. I have already talked about it. And another is a substantive part. It's like content that has been very well uh, elaborated and Amanda has mentioned about it. How it worked, I mean, now I would like to, uh, you know, the, this is the relevant, this is the side event of the MRIP. And this tool can be very helpful for MRIP directly and indirectly. Why? Because this tool uh, provides a pragmatic as, um, tools for assessment of the constitution of respect, reflect, respective countries. And then um, I agree with Amanda. Uh, now the conventional thought about thinking about the constitution and constitutional matters that has been sifted a lot. Now the ordinary people, they should have like the capacity or they should be able to understand the constitution, to analyze the constitution. This is the right tool. So I, I guess that I've, I've been participating in lots of UN's meetings and forums. So uh, the many interventions are very good, but not technically probably that helpful to the specific, to, to support to the specific mandate of the UN forums or mechanisms such as EMRIM. So these tools, if it is, has been widely used by the indigenous peoples and ordinary, what we call in a legal term is a layman, uh, they can understand and they can realize about the, uh, the constitution and they can come up with a very good intervention so that can be helpful for the MRIP. I guess that I would encourage to use and to at least read these uh, tools and use it because these, these all, the another good point about this tool, what I found is, it uses the demystified languages, very simple, plain languages laymen can understand about it. What we say often when we talk about the constitution, constitution is a living document, so it can be changed. If we have to rectify about the constitution, if there is gaps and laps we can identify and that if we have to rectify, if we have to amend it, this will be very, very helpful. And I should stop here, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shankar. Those are excellent remarks and a, a really good balance to learn a bit about Nepal um, and also some ideas about how the tool might be useful um, to different actors. So thank you very much for your um, continual support. And yes, the tool is very much, I should have said this in the development um, design for Nepal. Actually, originally it was created in Nepal. Um, both Lana and myself were uh, working there and thought that it would be very relevant to the process, of course, and then it was um, expanded to be globally relevant, but it was Nepal that truly inspired us to um, undertake this work and just looking at the extent to which Indigenous peoples' issues were, were relevant and being discussed in the constitution-making process. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Ronnie Saliga. Yes, uh, thank you, Amanda, and good evening to our uh, participants virtually and of course to my co-presenter. Uh, uh, thank you also for inviting me to this uh, web webinar, Amanda. Uh, just to give a little context, uh, Amanda, I think uh, the situation of the indigenous people still in, Bang in the Bangsamoro is quiet, uh, distinct compared to others. Because like uh, while we have the constitution of the, uh, the the country, the Philippines, but we have also the little constitution, which is the Bangsamoro Organic Law, that uh, many of the provisions that recognizes the rights of Indian peoples in the Philippines constitution, some of these are already devolved to the uh, autonomous uh, Bangsamoro government. So that's uh, why some uh, there is a problem usually in, in claiming this to the national government because the national government are keep on saying that you can claim this in the regional government. That was the uh, the issues of the Indian peoples even uh, before. And so sad because in the crafting of the constitution, even the armed law before, the, part, the Indian peoples did not have any participation that's, that is also the reason why during our assessment, I think we see some uh, deficiency in the law itself as far as the protection of the rights of the Indigenous peoples is concerned. So the tool actually help us uh, revisit. And I just come to see that in the Philippines Constitution, the same provisions 
that applies for our Bank Samoro also applies to us. You see, this is the now this is the create some uh, level of confusion because like on the identity, the same uh, identity are claiming by the but there are like like for us we have the different situation compared to the others. So uh, somewhat a minority within a minority indigenous people. So that's uh, the situation. And with this, with this uh, tool, actually, I appreciate the tool when we do it in, I think that was February or 2019 when you have the assessment. Because uh, like what I said, in constitution making, usually we need the participation. Indigenous people's participation is vital. You cannot do any legislations like what we are doing. We, we can maybe frame the best pass, the best legislations, but without the indigenous people's participation, it is still useless. You see, so we really need, because ownership, we need to ensure that the indigenous people's claim ownership over such uh, legislative measures that we pass in the Congress, because uh, I mean in the, in the parliament. So the, the, the tool in itself provided the opportunity for the indigenous peoples because they seldom use what they seldom participate, especially if it is uh, a government uh, initiated because sometimes discrimination is there or the process in itself is not uh, suited for them. So with, with this tool, I think they can do whatever they want and they can, at least with their own understanding, they can help uh, participate on analyzing what uh, are, are these provisions really responded or to the to their issues. Yeah. So, so that that one thing, and especially now also that we are drafting our own uh, our own laws. I think uh, that the tool is very, very relevant because we managed to get what they really want to be included you know, in the, prov the provisions that uh, recognize their economic, cultural, and political rights. You see, they have the representation. And there are provisions actually, like uh, on the issue of identity, we manage with the participation, we, we manage to make a more uh clarity cl clear definition as to differentiate the non moro from the indigenous people because the indigenous people that's applied to everybody now for the minority one so that's that's the term the non moro indigenous peoples and the very good thing is the people are sta stand uh stand stand to this uh to this definition so they because they really appreciate it because it comes it comes from them so another another one that i appreciate uh, with this tool also is it uh, created consensus among the leaders especially in pr prioritizing among the issues which one they think is to be included you no know, to, to be included in the in the legis this legislation in the ip code that we have drafted so that thing that thing is uh, very important and at least we managed to some issues that were not so clear in the BOL, we managed to make it really uh, articulated clear in the I IP code. Though maybe not all the issues are in included, but the substantive uh, uh, sub sub substantive issues were, were really articulated in that law. So later maybe you, you, can, you can see that uh, because I think uh, part of the inspiration in crafting that law is the input that we got in our uh, workshop on the IP cut uh, workshop. Secondly, that uh, I think uh, very much uh, important also in in this uh, in the tool, it creates some uh, feeling of. Uh, how do I call it? For the IP really to claim that this law is not for the Bank Samoro government, not for anybody else, but it's for them. 
So that 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 one. And I, I think the most important also with the with the Bangsamor organic law because before we managed to articulate that the recognition of the rights in the Bangsamoro should not go beyond the constitution and it should uh, observe international, should be in accordance with the UN DRIP, with the UDSR, the United Declaration of Human Rights, and the national laws, which is the IPRA. So meaning to say that alone is already a uh, advantage for, for the indigenous peoples because the, all the minimum, all the minimum uh, standards are in place, but they need to just know what are still lacking, you know? what are still lacking, which uh, I think through, through the workshop we did and some subsequent activities we did, they managed to identify what other issues that need to be uh, articulated and be cleared in the I, I, IP law. So I think that's that one uh, that one is very much important also for us. So if I may sum up, so ownership through this tool, and I, I think the participation, of course, of the indigenous peoples and articulating some issues that were not uh, clear in the some organic law or in the, in the Philippine constitution to make it more uh, relevant in the case of the industry policy in the Bank Samoro, because really they have a unique uh, situation here. You know? So the tool really is uh, very, uh, shall I call it uh, very appropriate, especially for indigenous people who seldom participate in like government initiated or some other initiative because you know IPs are so quiet, uh, shy because of the sometimes they are discriminated if they are group with or some other some groups are calling it uh, calling active uh, conducting activities for themselves. So at least with this tool, they can manage to really share and articulate, participate to ensure that uh, their issues should be tackled or included in the uh, discussion. So I, I think uh, that's what uh, all can I share, Amanda? Excellent, thank you, Romy. That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. a lot and right on time. So I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you uh, for reflecting on the different ways that the tool was able to help um, in creating consensus on priorities and really helping, um, I think what you said is, is really key. We, we recognize again that um, of course, indigenous, including indigenous people's rights in constitutions is, is very important, but then pushing for implementation of those rights and making sure that they're real on the ground and um, is a whole nother thing. And also the framing of the rights themselves should be done in a way that respects self-determination, which is why it's critical that indigenous peoples are included yes. in the original conversations around legal reform. Um, and also then are able to effectively participate. And I think that's really, was our hope and certainly my hope with the tool is that it would be um, really a tool for communities to be able to engage in more constructive evidence-based advocacy mm -hmm. um, so that they're not entering into antagonistic relationships with the government, but actually constructive relationships where very much as you're saying, um, the suggested definitions and terms for legal reform are actually coming from the communities themselves um, and then being adopted by the government. So I think that that sounds like the right order of yes. things. Um, and if the tool can enable that, then that's, that's very important to us. Um, so I want to thank both the speakers for their excellent perspectives. Um, we have about half an hour left for the event. So I'd like to turn it over for any questions now. I don't, I don't see any yet in the chat box, but if anyone has questions, um, feel free to direct them at, at any of us as panelists, and we'd be happy to address from, from our perspective. So I'd like to just open the floor. Are there questions? Um, um, so Fiona says, Romy, really nice to capture the capacity of the tool to empower Indigenous peoples to own the laws and their reform. Um, do I see the tool as a means for providing a platform for conversation or engagement between Indigenous peoples across regions, for example, through cross-regional advocacy? Um, thank you so much for that question. I think it's excellent. And yes, definitely, um, you know, what we're really hoping is that over time, 
we'll be able to run this tool in, in more and more places and sort of have a body of comparative knowledge, not only what's in the tool already, um, but really how these things are working in practice. So these conversations today with Shankar and Romy are already an example of that, you know, to really understand the nuances of indigenous people's rights. We have to um, examine how these things are unfolding in practice. And I think a lot can be gained from dialogue and discussion because often um, the law itself can look quite good on paper. I mean, I think the Philippines is an excellent example. The um, Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, the national piece of legislation is written almost exactly off of the UN drip. So it follows yeah. every provision. It's very progressive um, and includes a lot of excellent rights. Um, but there wasn't as much thought put into maybe how those were gonna be actually implemented in practice. It was just the sort of drive yeah. to be committed to international standards, which is important, but then balancing that with feasibility with local context and making sure um, that it works is, is critical. So um, I think hopefully through cross regional dialogues, um, also cross country, cross border, um, bringing indigenous groups together to kind of share what is their assessment of their constitutions and are they facing some of the same challenges um, so that they can brainstorm on how, how to overcome those together, um, both using the international system, but also domestic systems, hopefully for implementation of constitutions. Um, all right. Are there any other, other questions or, I don't know if the panelists have questions for each other. Um, you could ask Abanda from uh, a question from uh, to both Romeo and uh, Shankar about the about implementing or using the tool. If uh, you did you encounter any challenges of applying to tool, and if you did, if if any, if you find any any parts any way of parts of it more challenging than the other. What may have helped in in your case, or or if you would have any other advice on us on how to how to make sure that it's as user friendly as possible. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Linaji. Uh, it's a very relevant uh, and then important questions that you raised it. That how we can make it more uh, user friendly, or how uh, the outreach of the two that can be uh, <clears throat> made. One thing that, uh, as I said, that this is the uh, the tool is in the demystified languages of many legal terms, and it's still there, but that has been expla explained very well in a simple language so people can understand it. But it's still, uh, there is a challenge of uh, language barrier because of the, you know, the the English, which is not the first language of many uh, indigenous peoples, uh, very few have like, um, they can understand English. So if that can be translated into another languages and another, uh, what I found is this tool is not only, uh, it's a <clears throat> very useful for indigenous people, but those other, um, their bodies and authorities uh, or leaders who is working in indigenous sectors or working for indigenous peoples. It's also very important for them also, because that we we have, I mean, uh, there are good constitutions having like a positive, a progressive constitution as Amanda termed about it, that having a good provision about the indigenous peoples that reflects about the aspirations of the indigenous peoples. And also, uh, but the, again, that uh, that is not the sufficient. So that has to be translated into the ground, then meaning to say that there should be the another level of laws that has to be, you know, the, the enacted to substantiate about the constitutional provisions. But this tool will give exactly the right information that how that the constitution provisions will be translated into the law and that can be implemented in the ground so the people can feel about what is written in the constitution, it's number one, right? So this is very useful for the lawmakers as well, the parliamentarians as well, right? And also the lawyers uh, themselves also, it's not necessary that the all lawyers are the constitutional lawyers. So they need a kinds of, uh, 
the knowledge, special knowledge about the constitutional law. That is not sufficient. If you are even the constitutional lawyer, you may not understand about the indigenous people's, you know, the law or indigenous people's uh, concerns. You may have to face the challenge about it. This tool will give you the correct and pragmatic information in your career as well, in your legal field as well. So this is also the very useful for lawyers as well. That's what uh, I felt, I mean, I, I, I have a feeling. Even that uh, Amanda says that we, after promulgation of the constitution, we have filed a number of cases in the Supreme Court. We got like very good, uh, jurisprudence and precedents uh, from the Supreme Court. We, we use these tools that how to, you know, that uh, to get like the references to substantiate or our logic or argument in the court, right? So that's why this is very helpful for practicing lawyers as well. Not only the lawmaker, not only the leaders, not only the indigenous peoples, because what we have to think about it, the, the constitution is not only the the uh, only for certain people, certain elite people, certain you know the, the groups, but it should be for all. So that why what happened is when we use the questionnaires as a test on the ground, I realized about it. We translate it into Nepali. So the people are talking about and interpreting about the provisions of the constitution of uh, Nepal, referring to the UN trip, referring to the convention 169, referring to the provision of the, the, the Bolivi Bolivian constitution in relation to the land territories and uh, natural resources in relation to autonomy, right? So that's why what I feel about it, this tool would be helpful for nation building process as well in a broader sense, in a practical manner, right? So I should stop here. So maybe my suggestion would be, it should be translated into the different indigenous languages. And so prepare in a, you know, the thematic basis as well, what Amanda says about it. Maybe some people can use only one theme like land territories and natural resources. Maybe other people can use about like autonomy and self-determination self part, or other can use about the free prior and informed consent. So that, that's why uh, maybe more resources will be produced and it will be, it will be a very uh, helpful uh, for the indigenous peoples and other stakeholders as well. Yes, uh, I, I agree with uh, what uh, my co-presenter had had said. Really, the, there are there are terminologies that usually do not have an equivalent to the IP language. So that's why uh, an, an expert maybe can help in articulating, in explaining what does it mean. And when we translate it in the provisions, usually have the difficulty there because if we put it that way, then look at uh, the constitution, it might end as illegal because it, the, you cannot find it anywhere in the constitution. So what we did use usually is, is there any creative way or other way of explaining it without necessarily become illegal because it's, or unconstitutional because there is no basis in the constitution. So uh, we did some like flexibility in the provisions so that uh, it can still be accommodated. You, you, you know, because indigenous people's practices really are sometimes, uh, if we look at it and the, at the constitution of the country, it's always unconstitutional because you cannot find it now in the constitution in all the provisions. So you need to some sort of articulation that it can still be find a ways in in the provisions that can still be accommodated, or else we need to introduce it. I, I think that's also good with 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 us because we are legislating new laws. So these new laws sometimes we manage to incorporate some word, some terminologies that are not in the constitution, but uh we include it in the uh because at least we are um, we are empowered or we are authorized to as long as supported uh, by
since we lost uh, Rami, maybe he's coming back. Uh, give him a moment to come into focus. Yeah. Uh, All right. Um, well, I guess uh, we'll wait for him and see if he can and join again. Um, otherwise, if there are no other questions from the audience, I think we'll move towards concluding the event. Um, but I'll just make sure there are no more questions. I don't see any in the chat. Um, so I think we've addressed most of them. I just want to reiterate that um, we remain as idea available to um, discuss this tool in more detail, um, especially Shankarji, I think your idea is about how to share this tool um, with MRIP itself. Um, I know this year's theme for Indigenous Peoples Day is actually reimagining the social contract. So in that way, this tool, I think, will be very timely for discussions this year um, around how constitutions are such an important site. Um, for Indigenous peoples' rights. Uh, I personally would just really like to thank um, especially the participants for really engaging and taking this seriously to reflect on your experience with the tool. Um, it means a lot to me and um, Lena's uh, support from the very beginning for us developing this tool and for really making Indigenous peoples' issues a priority for international idea, which um, we really hadn't worked on before. So I, I really want to thank her for that. And um, she's really created the space for that um, within the institution um, globally. So uh, I'm very grateful uh, to everyone who participated and for your support. Um, again, it's been six years coming this tool. So um, there's many other people who also participated uh, who weren't here today, but I, I do wanna say that Shankar and Lena have definitely been there from the very beginning and Romy um, played a very important role in helping us bring this into the hands of governments and really um, proving that this can be useful not only for civil society and indigenous communities, but also um, for government actors that are engaged in legal reform. So thank you very much to everyone. And um, please, again, know that the tool is free and available. We are exploring translations. Um, please send requests. Um, as Shankar said, of course, translations are very important, but the challenge is there are so many indigenous languages, it's a bit difficult for us to know um, which ones we should translate. And of course, also some, you know, we don't have translators on hand, but if you are interested, um, particularly in like a section of the tool that we could help to translate into your local language, then we are more than happy to explore those options as well. Um, so please do be in touch. Sewaro uh, to Shankar, and thank you very much to everyone who participated today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Lina Ji. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming. Thanks. And we, uh, I will say also thank you on behalf of Romy, because I'm sure that he would like to do that himself, yeah. but not here. Um, so thank you so much. I look forward to being in touch with all of you separately and in the future.